So thank you all. Thank you, Hande. Thank you all for being here. Um, I am uh, delighted to be in a room full of real people again for this venue after the last couple of years. And I'm looking forward to um, the rest of the day. Uh, let me see, it's okay. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start. So those are my disclosures right there at the bottom. So um, as most of you know, the overwhelming majority, ALS is a genetically very heterogeneous disease. So the overwhelming majority of patients suffer from sporadic disease. About 10% of the cases, uh, the disease runs in families and there's been a wealth of genetic breakthroughs over the last 20 years. And we now know that there are mutations in more than 40 genes that can cause ALS, rare forms of genetic ALS. And the central question that we're interested in addressing in my lab is whether there is mechanistic convergence uh, amongst all the distinct genetic subtypes of ALS and whether um, what we find about genetic subtypes of ALS is at all relevant for what happens to sporadic disease. And the way we do that is we study one gene at a time. And we have several posters at this meeting today describing people's work on different genes and hopefully if you have time, you'll uh, be able to see some of the work. So, uh, but what I'd like to do today over the next um, 18, 19 minutes or so is tell you about some unpublished work focused on c 72 uh, which is the largest genetic contributor to ALS as well as for the Nepoil dementia. So very briefly, the c 72 mutation is an intronic hexanucleotide repeat expansion, four Gs followed by two Cs, um, which um, in normal individuals, there's about 30 copies of these. In ALS patients, there's hundreds, sometimes thousands. So the mutation is not completely penetrant, but it highly predisposes people to getting ALS. And work from many labs over the last few years has shown that the repeat expansion can indeed be transcribed to form this irregularly long RNA molecule. And it can also become translated to form five dipeptide repeat proteins from uh, the sense and the anti-sense trans. These are known as GR, PR, GA, PA, and GP. And the glycine-rich GR and PR are thought to be, are, have been shown to be numerous in vitro models, mouse models, and so on and so forth, as being the most highly toxic ones. So we know, we also know that the uh, long RNA binds and sequesters RNA binding proteins to form typically nuclear RNA foci. And we also know that all the dipeptide repeat proteins can form aggregates that are found in mouse models, postmortem ALS patient tissue, and so on and so forth. Now, these aggregates are typically cytoplasmic, although in rare cases, they can be nuclear. Um, so we and others over the last few years have shown that because the long RNA binds and sequesters RNA binding proteins, and because the dipeptide repeat proteins bind and sequester a number of proteins which encompass so-called low complexity domains, um, there's an imbalance in the nuclear cytoplasmic proteome. And as I mentioned, the arginine-enriched GR and PR aggregates, which are, can be cytosolic as well as nuclear, have been, have been shown to be the most toxic. So the question that we really got um, interested in addressing is what role does RNA binding play in the toxicity of these arginine-rich dipeptide repeat proteins? And can we utilize that information to design potentially therapeutic strategies? So this is the simple question that we wanted to address, which is what I just mentioned. So um, to begin to address this question, we use the combination of um, um, simulations as well as empirical evidence to characterize the physicochemical properties of the arginine-rich GR and PR. And to cut a long story short, our, our um, experimental data showcase that several electrostatic and chemical bonds would favor interactions of poly-RDPRs with RNA molecules. And the types of bonds that we predicted are just shown here. So we started to um, investigate a little bit more about what the interaction with RNA would look like. And here, I'm just showing you the first thing that we did, which is some plain test tube experiments. So we synthesized highly pure versions of GR, PR, as well as GP as a negative control. GP is not an arginine reach that peptide, and it's not predicted to bind to RNA molecules. We put them in a test tube and then added total RNA within that test tube. And as you can show, as you can see here in these pictures, you can see that in the presence of total RNA, 
both the GR and PR form aggregations with the RNA. And we can resolve partially these by treating with RNAs. We cannot resolve them completely, which I guess is not surprising given that RNAs cannot degrade everything, all of the RNA that's in the test. We also found that while both RDPRs have the capacity to bind to all kinds, all classes of RNA molecules, including mRNA, tRNA, and ribosomal RNA, they exhibit some preferred subbinding to structured RNA molecules, such as tRNAs and mRNAs. And uh, RNA is shown here. However, what you see in a test tube is not always what happens in cells and in patients. So we next decided to do an experiment to identify native RNA binding partners for polyGR, uh, for the polyGR that PEPTA repeat. And to do this, we teamed up with Marco Bocchito and Sandra Woolen at the NIH. And we performed a, a clip seq experiment to identify native RNA Partners. So the way this experiment works is we took a construct which expresses 50 copies of the poly, of poly GR. It's tagged with a GFP. And as a control, we use GP or GFP alone. We put these in cells and then use UV cross-linking to um, cross-link potential RNA to protein complexes shown there in that schematic. I'm not sure that you can see my pointer. It doesn't look like it works very well. Um, so then you can isolate this protein RNA complexes, you can extract them and you do an RNA-seq experiment to identify the types of RNAs that are found. And these are some controls there at the bottom. These are Northern blood showing you that with increasing amounts of UV cross-linking, you start seeing the formation of RNA protein complexes in the last column with GF GFP GR50. And when you treat with RNAs, you're able to resolve these complexes. So we did this experiment and to our surprise, we found that the polyGR almost exclusively interacted with ribosomal RNA. And this is the data here. Uh, so you can see that 96% of the cleap reads that we identified in this experiment mapped to ribosomal RNA loci. There's some non-coding RNAs and a little bit of um, very few components of mRNAs. Now, importantly, ribosomal RNA is highly abundant. And it's, it's not surprising that our controls also pulled down ribosomal RNA but GFP, GR50 pulled down significantly more. Um, this is another way to show the data. And the reason I wanna show this volcano plot is because on the right, I'm showing you the individual peaks that were enriched for binding with polyGR. And what a point I wanna make is that there are numerous different um, ribosomal RNA species that correspond to what polyGR was bound to that are enriched in the right. However, when it comes to tRNA, which is highly abundant in cells, it seems to be de-enriched. And this is in stark contrast to what our in vitro experiment, what our test tube experiment shows. This is probably related to the fact that the uh, binding is determined by the localization of the proteins, as well as the availability of different types of RNAs. Now to get a better understanding of what types of uh, ribosomal RNAs, PolyGR was able to bind here, we map the sequencing data to a single full length cDNA um, sequence. And on the right, you sync two independent uh, cleap seq experiments for GFP GR50. And on the left, you're seeing the controls. And hopefully what you can see is that the cleap re reads map to specific ribosomal RNA loci. And the overwhelming signal that we found is reflected in the blue, blue color, which corresponds to 20S, which is type a precursor, um, which is one of the many species of ribosomal RNA. Uh, these are the sequencing tracks here, and at the bottom is our GFP control, and at the top are the sequencing tracks for GFP GR50. And I would like to point out that this is the 28S peak up here that was highly specific for our um, GR50. Um, um, so, okay, great, thank you, this is helpful. So uh, that's the peak that I'm talking about. So um, reviewers were concerned that um, ribosomal RNA is highly abundant and um, all kinds uh, of potential um, RNA binding proteins would be able to, to pull it down. So to do an additional control, what we did is we <laughs> used publicly available CLEAP-seq data sets from other RNA binding proteins that are known to bind and interact ribosomes. And hopefully what you can see here is that the specific peak that we identified for GR50 corresponding to 28S is completely absent from other publicly available data sets. 
So it's highly enriched in our data set. It's highly enriched relative to the controls and it's not found um, in other um, data sets. So for those of you that like me do not remember their basic biology um, classes, um, the ribosomal RNA is transcribed within the nucleus and it goes a series of very detailed processing steps almost entirely within the nucleolus and the nucleus to give rise to three mature ribosomal RNA species, 18S, 5.8S, and 28S. And these are the three species that will become part of the fully assembled mature ribosome. Now the peaks that we identified could be corresponding to a number of these ribosomal RNA species. And to validate our results and try and refine further what types of RNAs GR could bind to, we did um, immunoprecipitation assays followed by northern bloats and quantitative PCR. This is just some validation data to show you that indeed we can pull down 28S, 18S, 5.S, all these different ribosomal RNA species exclusively with GR50. So collectively, this data show that polyGR binds to multiple ribosomal RNA species, including precursors found in the nucleolus and mature RNAs that are found both in the nucleolus as well as the fully assembled cytoplasmic, cytoplasmic ribosomes. And we reason that if this data is true, there would be downstream, uh, th this would lead to an impairment of ribosomal assembly as well as downstream protein translation defects. Now, several other groups at the time have uh, had reported that there's protein translation defects in the presence of polyGR and polyPR, and our data was well aligned with that information. But the one thing that we wondered was that if indeed polyGR can bind to these ribosomal RNA species, then it would create probably an imbalance between in the localization of the ribosomal RNA itself. So we tested that in our system, and I'm just showing you here that in cells that overexpress GR50, we see a reduction in total ribosomal RNA, and we also see a significant shift in the nucleosoplasmic ratio of ribosomal RNA in that there's more ribosomal RNA stuck within the nucleus that does not make its way out to the cytoplasm. This is a cell-based cell, type, cell -based model. Does this happen in patients? Is this relevant at all for the disease? And the answer is yes. This is postmortem ALS tissue for three C9 ALS cases and three controls. These are brain cells. And what you can see here is the um, analysis of the nucleosoplasmic ratio of the ribosomal RNA itself. And you can see that basically there's a significant reduction with more of the more of the ribosomal RNA being stuck within the nuclei of the surviving neurons in postmortem ALS tissue. Now, the identification of this ribosomal RNA uh, as a binding partner for polyGR is very well aligned with numerous previous mass spec based studies that have reported that both polyGR as well as polyPR for that matter can bind to ribosomal RNA proteins, sorry, ribosomal proteins, not RNA. And in fact, uh, when we looked at all the data that was previously published, we found that there was one ribosomal protein known as RPL7A, which was the single ribosomal protein that every study uh, found to be a binding partner for PolyGR. So this caught our attention. And um, we then downloaded um, available um, um, cryo-M data of the mammalian ribosome to look at where these RPL7 uh, protein subunit is found. And to our surprise, what we found was that RPL7A is sitting on the surface of the ribosomal, uh, of the fully assembled ribosome, right next to the 20S peak, the ribosomal RNA species that we identified in our CLEPSIC data. So using this information, we're able to create an in silico model of the fully assembled ribosome, and we're able to identify what is likely one of many binding pockets that polyGR can, can dock within the fully assembled ribosome. So this pocket is comprised of the 28S um, ribosome RNA species that again, we identified in the CLEPSEQ, as well as RPL7 shown here in green. So we took this a step further and we did molecular uh, simulation analysis, dynamic simulation analysis to try and understand what are the dynamics of this interaction between polyGR as well as the different components that are found within the pocket of the fully assembled ribosome. And this is the simulation of the energy of the interaction across time. And again, to our surprise, what we found was that our models predicted that the interaction between polyGR and ribosomal RNA would be is, has 
significantly higher energy than the interaction between PolyGR and RPL7 or any of the ribosomal proteins that are found within that region. So this data is suggesting that it is the interaction of PolyGR with the RNA that's mediating its binding to the ribosome rather than the interaction between PolyGR and ribosomal proteins within the ribosome. So um, this gave us an additional idea because we wanted to experimentally test whether we can inhibit this interaction of PolyGR with a fully assembled ribosome um, based on the information that we had in our hands. So we thought, how can we potentially inhibit this interaction? And then maybe we can use the um, CLEPSIC data that we have, because we identified a very narrow peak of, poly G of um, binding of poly PolyGR to the ribosomal RNA to potentially design an oligonucleotide, which could potentially act as a bait sequestering GR away from its binding partners. So we decided to, to do that. So um, the peak that we identified on 28S corresponded to about 150 nucleotides. So we designed one RNA molecule right in the middle of, of that binding site, which is um, similar in sequence as well as in chemistry to clinical grade antisense oligonucleotide molecules. We call this the 28S ribosome RNA bait. And as a control, we designed a scrambled sequence uh, bait, sequ bait RNA that was similar in, um, in chemistry, but different in sequence. So the first thing we did, we confirmed that this bait could indeed bind to PolyGR in a vitro in a test tube. And you can see that it can bind very strongly, but equally, uh, to, equally strongly to a scrambled bait control. Again, this is a test tube experiment. We next put this thing in bait, it, we put this thing in cells, and we showed that it can enter cells. It's not toxic uh, at all. <coughs> and we also showed that in cells, this 28S bait is highly specific in its ability to bind PolyGR. It does not bind GFP, and PolyGR exclusively seems to bind 28S and not the scrambled control bait that we also synthesized. So uh, I only have two minutes, so I just want to finish by showing you some uh, experiments where we utilize this bait to understand whether we can mitigate the toxic effects associated with PolyGR. So firstly, we did this in a cellular model system, and the experiment is we uh, delivered PolyGR as well as a bait or the scramble control. And to cut it long, a long story short, what we're finding is that in the presence of the 20S ribosomal RNA bait, we see an increase in the translation levels in these cells. We see a concomitant decrease in the nucleoplasmic ratio of ribosomal RNA, which again would be the downstream defects of PolyGR binding to ribosomal RNA. We next wanted to test this in a, in a neuronal model system. So for this, we made stem cell derived wild type motor neurons, which we transfected with 50 copies of PolyGR. And surprisingly, we found that only about 10% of these neurons degenerate across 80 days in culture, um, it turns out that the cells that degenerate are ones that, if I can make this movie play, maybe I can't. But in short, it turns out that the motor neurons that degenerate are exclusively ones that accumulate PolyGR within the nucleus. And we're able to uh, demonstrate that by tracking individual cells. And again, to cut a long story short, what we're finding is the accumulation of PolyGR within the nucleus is basically a death sentence for these motor neurons. As soon as PolyGR ends up in the nucleus, we have downstream defects in ribosomal homeostasis and the motor neurons degenerate. So the question is, can our 28S ribosomal RNA bait inhibit that toxicity? And the answer is yes. It can do, significant, it can do so significantly more effectively than the scrambled control. However, this is again an overexpression system in a human neuron to test it in a more physiological model um, I'll just skip that data. We teamed up with Justin Ichida's group at USC, and we tested the ability of the 28S RNA to mitigate poly polygr toxicity in modern neurons derived from three c 72 ls patients, as well as three, three uh, healthy controls. And again, we find that the poly, that the 28S bait is able to significantly mitigate the toxicity associated with the c 72 mutation in patient modern neurons um, and this is the data shown in individual cases. 
Last but not least, for my last 30 seconds, we wanted to test the ability of this molecule to mitigate toxicity in an in vivo model system. And to do this, we teamed up with Ude Pande at, at UPIT, who utilizes Drosophila models. And we started by using a highly toxic model of GR uh, toxicity, where basically flies that express uh, GR50 uh, fail to eclose, fail to reach adult stages. And when we indeed give labeled 28 s bait to these flies, it makes it within the neuronal, within the uh, nervous system, within their neurons. And we see a small but highly significant and unexpected mitigation of toxicity in that basically 0% of flies that express GR50 are able to reach adulthood, but about 9% of cases when are fed this 28S, 28S bait within their food are able to reach adult stages. So those are the conclusions. I don't have time to go through, through the detail, but the one thing that I want you to remember is that CLEPSIC analysis allowed us to design a specific ribosomal RNA uh, bait, uh, which can protect against polyGR C972 associated toxicity. Uh, I'd like to highlight Alberto Ortega, who is a former postdoctoral uh, fellow in my lab, and Andrew Fleming, who's in the audience, who has led this project after Alberto left the lab. And I try to thank the different collaborators who uh, facilitated this work along the talk. Thank you to Lester Foundation for the continued support, the York Stem Cell Foundation, and the NIH. And thank you for your time.